Jacqueline Novogratz, actually, I didn't even like come prepare an intro, but you, you started Acumen how long ago? 20 years. 20 years ago. And you have progressive, wow, progress, right. <laughs> progressively expanded your purview, your effectiveness, you're operating globally. You've always had an orientation towards innovation um, and, and entrepreneurship which is unusual for an NGO that's trying to intervene in communities. So that's part of what I want to discuss with you. But um, what we called this session was declaring American interdependence, which came out of something you said on the prep call. And it was very powerful. So when you think about American interdependence, what do you mean? Um. Nice starting question. Thanks, David. And it's great to be here. Um, I think particularly in this moment of history, we seem to be dividing between the nationalists who are focusing on this country all the time and the globalists who see all of our problems as needing to be solved globally. And the truth is all of our, all of our stories and all of our solutions right now have a great deal of interdependence. And we've seen it with the pandemic, now that we're all dealing with Omicron. Um, if we don't find a way to solve some of these problems in particularly uh, frontier markets, lesser developed countries, they come right back to us. Um, there's a second level of our interdependence, which is that all of our supply chains now are much more transparent and it really matters. And it matters to a new generation in terms of are we keeping people essentially in modern day slavery for the choices that we make every day in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Looking at um, remittances and the migrants in the United States and their impact on income for their families in the nations in which they are living. Um, huge impact in terms of immigration, refugees. And the conversation where it started with you and I was um, around electricity when you yeah. still have 800 million people on the planet with no electricity, a problem that through entrepreneurship and markets we can largely solve, that not only do we have a problem that is unproductive, unjust, immoral within those nations, but again, it comes right back into America's health, America's well-being. And so American interdependence, we can no longer make decisions based as if our, our walls were not porous. We have to recognize ourselves within the context of a world in which all of our actions have impact, whether we see them or not. Great start. So I should have possibly asked you at the beginning, but I, I'm glad I didn't because what you just said was so good. Tell us a little bit about what Acumen is doing now in the United States and globally. Just give us a little picture of the organization you lead. It's impressive work. Um, so Acumen is essentially, an, as you said, a nonprofit venture fund for the poor. We're here to solve problems of poverty. Um, there are three main thrusts, starting with the right kind of capital. So the, at the core of what we do is raise philanthropy, take 10 to 15 year bets. I loved when Esther talked about long-term thinking on entrepreneurs that are trying to solve big problems of poverty, energy, agriculture, healthcare, education. Um, we support those companies with our social capital, with management assistance, with connections to other companies. Any money that comes back gets reinvested in innovation for the poor. Some of those companies get to a point where they're, they need to raise 50, $100 million at a time. And so we also have four for-profit funds, about another $200 million, so that we can grow and scale these companies. And then the third thing that we do is have a university um, because not only is the right kind of capital required in solving these problems, but the right kind of leadership, the right kind of talent. And so there's Acumen Academy. We operate in South Asia, East and West Africa, Latin America, and as you said, the United States. In the United States, we have about 38 companies. 60% of them are run by people of color. They're um, focused on three areas, the social determinants of healthcare, um, second financial inclusion, and third workforce development. And, and I actually think they're a real story that helps 
bridge the divide between left and right because we have a new breed of entrepreneurs who are here and are serious about solving problems and have so much creativity um, to build off where Esther was going and I think create a sense of what we could be if we got away from, uh, got ourselves out of the way. So what you train people to do in the academy is what exactly? We, we train them with the, what we said, the, t the skills, the tools, and what we would call the moral imagination to solve the problems of our day. That so many of our social entrepreneurs are limited by the amount of philanthropy they think they can raise. And so they focus on solving a problem at a very small scale. And what we need are systems breaking change. So number one, when we talk about moral imagination, you have to understand the reality of the markets in which you are operating. You have to understand and be able to put yourself in the shoes of low-income people, build problems from their perspective. So do you need to have a, a mind toward the world you wanna build. So the best example, which you have followed, David, um, for 15 years is Delight, which was um, started in 2007, two guys with a solar lantern um, at a time when there were 1.5 billion people in the world who had no access to electricity, came into our office, asked us to invest $250,000 to take a bet on them. Um, it was sort of a, a, a wing and a prayer at that time, except that we saw in them that, that moral imagination. Here's how we're gonna eradicate kerosene, which is dirty, expensive, highly polluting. And, and, and we recognized, they thought, how hard it was going to be you were talking with Esther about the status quo. Um, I had no idea that we were not only dealing with people's perceptions, their lack of income, their lack of financing mechanisms, there's their lack of infrastructure. Just to deploy these lighting systems. You yeah. couldn't even give it away. Yeah. There was no trust. Um, it was $30, which we thought, well, over three months, you pay it back and you'll never have to pay for your electricity again. Whereas with kerosene, you pay 50 cents a day and it's dirty and it's killing you and, and literally it's kill, sometimes killing your children. Um, forget about the fact that it throws off 100 million tons of carbon into the environment every year. But when people have come and gone over generations with newfangled technologies that break, why would they trust you? When you are making $2 a day, you don't have $30. So you had to find a way to finance at the rate of 50 cents a day. And um, and then cell phone banking came in, another innovation. People could now pay for electricity 50 cents a day as they were paying for, um, for, for kerosene. And long story, um, but today that company has brought clean, affordable light and electricity to 100 million low-income people. Wow. We've become the largest off-grid solar investor in the world. And so from this start of not really understanding what we were doing or that there was even a market because there wasn't a market in 2007, our companies now represent 30% of all human beings on the planet who have solar light and electricity off grid um, who are poor. And so, thank you. And so it's really shown me that that kind of entrepreneurship, if you get out of the box of business as usual, traditional capital, if you have the patience, if you insist on building the right kind of talent, we can solve these problems. We only have 800 million more people to go. And, um, and I actually believe that universal electricity is the one SDG, sustainable development goal that we truly can meet as a world. But not again, if we leave it to the governments or leave it to traditional investment, but that we actually look at the nations um, and the state at which they're operating um, and again, use the right kind of capital. Surely you think we can meet more than one of the SDGs. I truly do. There's 17 of them after all. Right? I, I truly do, but first of all, they're, 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 they're big they're and big. they're not necessarily easy to quantify in terms of how we measure. Right. Um, this one is, and we can actually, 85% of all people on earth who have no access to electricity live in 15 African countries. Those countries have an average a median age of 19, an unemployment rate in many of the countries of 80%. Um, and Africa as a whole has a, has a, is only 55% electrified. 
It is the only continent that is going to double in population. And so you want to talk about American interdependence. Yeah. We have to solve this problem. It is eminently possible. And, um, and I actually feel that, that there's a real plan that we can put into place to do so. Talk a little more about what that would be then. I mean, it's just continuing on offering electricity, offering <laughs> new forms of financing. Give, give a little more on that. So if you look at the 800 million, 450 million will get electricity just with the markets as they have been built now by all of these entrepreneurs that, that didn't exist 15 years ago. Many of whom you've helped finance. Many of whom we've helped finance um, and who've really taught us. Then there's 100 million people at the bottom that will have to be supported with government and pure charity or philanthropy. Um, then there are 230 to 250 million people in the middle. Um, they live in countries like Benin and Burundi and Chad and South Sudan. Um, and they have the money, they're paying for kerosene on a daily basis. But no traditional investors will go in and they tend to be more violent countries. They're not easy to operate. And yet human beings are resilient and resourceful. And so what we've seen over 15 years is you give people the capability to buy and, and you show them that it will work and they will buy. And so we are putting together um, a financing facility that will have a grant component. So we'll give a company a, a significant grant to go into a country that it would not otherwise go into, um, make a loan, three to $5 million, if they reach X number of people, let's call it a million people in a country, um, then they only have to pay back 90% of that loan. So in fact, you use philanthropy to jumpstart what should be good government policy and a government rebate to provide the right kinds of incentives that actually from a national and frankly international basis, allow the foundation of an economy um, to show the kinds of returns to the public good. And that for me justifies the subsidy at the, at the front and the subsidy at the back, but it's based on actual impact, actual performance. Really, really interesting. One of the things we've talked about a lot here today, partly because EDF is one of our partners, is climate, climate change. And I know you have a lot of thoughts about how that intersects with your work, because pretty much all the people you're working with are the most vulnerable the ones which we've talked about here today in regard to the United States, but also globally, that climate impacts disproportionately poor, less, less advantaged people. Um, talk about just how you do think about that and how you think about the work you're doing and, and its urgency given this extraordinarily rapidly changing climate we're in. And, and, and then we can tie it back to the interdependence theme too. Yeah, so we're at the front lines. We work in agriculture and, uh, and, and trying to build agricultural resilience and adaptation to climate crisis and energy as we're talking about. And I would say, um, going back to the energy front, the, 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 the biggest, I would say, misunderstanding when we talk about climate justice is that we only focus on the United States and Europe. And obviously it's so critical for our economies that we find ways to transition people from fossil fuel industries into the green economy, no doubt. But when we're really looking at the big issues of climate equity, we, we have to look at these, the, the billion people that have no access to electricity whatsoever and find ways to get them access to energy in ways that help avert long-term climate crisis. It's estimated that we're going to need 5x the energy that we have today, just as these countries grow. That better be clean energy, or we're really in trouble. I mean, globally, five times more energy distributed. Than we have everywhere. right now. Yeah. 12x clean energy, if we're actually going to get to 100% clean energy. And so this is a massive transition. We cannot leave the developing world out. And as I said, when you look at a continent like Africa, which is half unelectrified, the interdependence then comes back um, in that in Ethiopia, an, Ethi an American family consumes a hundred times more energy than an Ethiopian family. We are a long way to go. Um, those Ethiopian families where we have the largest chicken 
farm in the country that works with about 20 million smallholders. Um, wow. Okay. It's an amazing company, and it's really important for climate and she resilience. Does housing and a lot of other stuff, by the way. But go on. Well, I don't do it. Well, I mean, I, I'm like chief cheerleader. But okay, you, you're cheerleading um, housing and other things. Too, so. our, our my our teams are awesome, but the um, but 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 Ethio Chicken, um, which is now in a country and it's a great example, enormous destabilization right now, a country teetering um, at civil at civil war. Yes. Um, that is connected to climate crisis, inequality, in extreme poverty that is only growing, um, exacerbated by what's happening with social media and how easy it is to divide people in these times of such scarcity. That has implications for our military, our security, and for the stability of the region, which is really important to the United States. Um, but that's only one tiny example. I, we could go across the continent. Well, you personally do spend a lot of time visiting these countries, visiting these people in these projects. I do, I do. And, and you have seen the people who, and what, what it's like for so many people that are so different from us. And, and yet they are about to be horribly affected by climate change in almost every case, because that is a universal right now with extreme weather taking on every community in the world. So it does come back to, I mean, I think you, you said it to me on the phone regarding um, this interdependence point. It, those people are not gonna stay put if we don't help them well, that's where, improve actually, their David, lives. I, I do, I, I'm, until the pandemic, I spent 70% 70, 70 of my time in Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Colombia, and, um, and I would actually say those people are not so different from us. That, that the, the big lesson after 35 years of this work is that, that we are they and they are, are we. And that if either I were a mother or if I were a 19 year old kid in a country with an 80% unemployment rate with no electricity, but I had a smartphone and 70% of Africans have smartphones, um, there is no way I'd be sitting around waiting for no job and no opportunity. I would be finding my way to another place. So if we didn't think that we had a refugee and an immigration issue today, fast forward 30 years when you've got 2.4 billion people at a minimum, we have, we're gonna have a completely new conversation. And if you look at Nigeria, um, which has just had devastating drought and floods, um, Kenya was accompanied not only with the droughts and the floods, but locust swarms, these farms, are getting decimated and we've got to find solutions. What gives me hope is how resilient human beings are. Yeah. And that when you build in ways that give people their own decision-making, their own choice, their own dignity, we, we start to build pathways to solve these problems. And, and I do think America could do more to, to export the best of our entrepreneurship, not to make money, but to solve problems. Yeah, and Central America is kind of a laboratory for this in a way, because they have had horrible hurricanes. They've had all kinds of e economic, political, and weather crises. And they are leaving in large numbers, and they are trying to come here. So it's not like a theoretical thing. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have the right to come here, by the way, but it's happening, and we have to recognize well, that Well, no one this wants to leave equation. their country. What? People don't want to leave their country. They want to. They want to live. They want to they, stay with their families yeah. and their friends. It, but if they can't, they won't. But if they can't, they won't. Yeah. And we wouldn't either. Of course not. And so, what's exciting to me about Central America and Latin America, and I'm seeing the same thing in the United States, which I hope we also talk about. But that is, um, there's a new generation of entrepreneurs that yes. are truly hell bent on using. The business of ch or folks on the business of change, not the business of profit right. alone. They're all That's focused a good on profit. The business of change, not the business of profit. And like um, and they are in some ways reimagining capitalism um, that in ways that's again use that moral imagination. Start with the farmers. So we have a company called Azahar in um, in Colombia, which I have visited many times, and. Um, the Tyler Youngblood, who is this just great entrepreneur, uh, woke up, one, how much he loved coffee, two, that there's this whole coffee movement in the United States, and went to Colombia to see the, the coffee and realized that 58% of all coffee farmers 
um, lose money in producing their coffee. Wow. Um, and if you look across the world, 80% of people living in poverty are smallholder farmers. Um, and so he made the decision that the system is so broken. It's all dictated by essentially global commodities prices that come from whatever happens to Brazil is what happens to the price. And, and yet here are some of the best coffee beans in the world. And so he said, well, what if I turn the whole thing upside down? And I start with understanding the costs to the farmer. Negotiate with them, not just a, a minimum wage, um, but a living wage. Would anybody actually buy these beans? And it's taken a while, um, but he now works with companies like Stumptown and Blue Bottle, and he gives them three choices. He says, here's the global commodities price, keeps people in poverty. Here's the minimum wage, keeps them just above poverty, but pretty much in poverty. Here's the living wage, which is sometimes 4X what the global commodities price is. And with that kind of transparency and this increasing knowledge that young people especially want to know where their coffee comes from, how is it grown and who is growing it, 30% of these companies are choosing to pay the living wage. That gives me huge hope. And we're seeing these kinds of business models coming out of some of the Latin America entrepreneurs. And equally, I think in part because so many of our Acumen America entrepreneurs um, have either or have either immigrated or have had experiences in other countries, they're bringing some of the innovation of what it has taken to operate in fragile um, economies. And they brought, brought them to the United States in ways that I, I think have so much to teach us around healthcare and around our big, some of our biggest problems. Mm, wonderful. Um, questions or comments from the audience, including online, feel free to uh, jump in if you have any thoughts. Um, you look pensive, Esther. Were you about to say something? No, okay. Um, Question is, do you work with fair trade? These groups, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, yes, the, the short answer is, is yes. Even fair trade is starting to evolve to that next stage, I would say, that, that the fair trade movement was... was we, we, it all needs reimagining. Um, and so, so Paul Rice, who's just been such a leader in the fair trade movement, is really excited and interested in this. Um, it's a whole new world with that just, I think, really shows us what's, what's possible. But there's, there, you've pointed to several things that I want to just sort of end on. One is there is a tremendous generational shift, and this has come up multiple times today, I think probably in at least four or five different sessions that young people feel differently about these issues of sustainability, fairness, equality, and it's a very positive sign for our future. That was said repeatedly on the stage today. You are in touch with not just some of those people, but those, some of those people who are themselves entrepreneurs, and you have a big handle on the nature of innovation that's happening around a lot of the critical issues. So I'm eager to hear you say, where you see the most promise and where you're maybe most optimistic about future innovations that, that are sort of just beginning to bubble up and have global, social, national, cultural, economic impact. Where do, are you seeing the most hope going forward? Where I'm seeing the most hope is in, it, it's more in processes than in specific technologies or, or sectors. The process being, um, a, a generation that entrepreneur, of entrepreneurs that have the courage and can be the role models that are looking to solve the problems and then are building with a, with a much greater palette the kinds of financial instruments that they need to do it. So we talked a little bit about every table, which is a um, guy from Wall Street wants to solve the, the problem of food deserts in the United States. It's part of our social determinants of healthcare portfolio. And, um, starts a nonprofit, but you can only train women so much if there's no food for them to buy that they can afford in a food desert like Compton in Los Angeles. So he starts a, a healthy, nutritious, affordable, fast food restaurant um, called Every Table. It is so valued by the community that he grows very quickly to eight restaurants. Pandemic happens, lockdown happens. He sends a tweet and says, look, 
My mission is fat, affordable, nutritious food. If you need us to deliver it to your house, we will. If you cannot afford it, we'll deliver it anyway. If you're willing to pay it forward, here's a link. And overnight, people across Los Angeles started putting all this philanthropy in. And then he partnered with government. And to date, he has delivered over 8 million meals wow. to people across Los Angeles. Through this period, he realized that um, if you look at the franchising model in fast food, very few low-income people of color have access to own a franchise. Uh, cost a million and a half dollars? Who has that kind of capital? Um, and yet you've got entrepreneurial people in low-income communities that want in. And so he, he again, broke the rules. And he, he built a nonprofit, uh, Every Table Academy, to teach people how to build and run a franchise. And right now he's raising a $20 million concessionary debt fund. So the debt providers will get just a few percentage points back over the next 10 years. But that money will be on lent to people like this woman I just, I haven't met her, but was just talking to Sam about, um, worked at a, a Carl's Jr. for 25 years, has all of this experience, and she will be, is a, a franchise soon to be owner, $45,000 a year guaranteed income, will take on this loan, and when she pays it off, she will be a franchise, and they are on track to add 65 franchises over the next year. All across the country, right? They're bringing four to New York next year. Wow. And, um, and it's a model, David, that says, we don't have to have this dreary idea of we're gonna, you know, in the 90s, I was part in New York City, like, let's bring one path mark to Harlem. It was so hard to work through the status quo of politics and government. To, and then we had to pay all the security costs. This is of, by, for the community in a way that uses the tools of capitalism, but isn't controlled by capitalism to solve these problems in ways that a new generation can understand and be part of. Fantastic. Uh, one final question. You know, when you started, you were among the very few providing capital for the kind of things you're doing. But there's a lot more capital interested in this kind of work than there used to be. I assume you would agree with that. Yes. And it still needs to be stretched because we have, the good news is that there's so many people that want to use impact investing to do good. But, the, but the, the overwhelming majority of it wants to get a return and make sure they're not doing harm or doing a little good. What we need to do is push the field in this moment of such extreme inequality where we have the wealth to focus on the problem that we want to solve first and then structure the right kind of capital to do so. And that's, that's Impact Investing 2.0. Good, well, thank you so much. Really good. To talk to you for a lot longer, but the work you've done has been inspiring from the beginning. And thank you so much for coming and talking to us about it. Well, David, thank you for truly accompanying us. And you were one of the few crazy journalists who were like, there's something here. I'm not sure I fully understand it. You were amazing and I just appreciate it. And I'm excited to see Work Magazine also reimagine itself. Yes, and we should have said you're on Worth's Worthy 100 list. Uh, um, so well, that's- Well, thank you. No, I just think this is a moment in history where we are facing such peril and we can solve our problems. That's a great ending. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you.